Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for July 19th, 2021. I'm Glenn Fleischman, in for Jackson Bird, who is on vacation. Coca-Cola brings your dead taste buds back to life with a new Coke Zero formulation that probably, definitely, certainly won't produce a new Coke outrage. Olympic athletes can perform team gymnastics on the beds provided in Japan. And how to watch Jeff Bezos fly into space with all his money. All that and duct tape fashion. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Coca-Cola's introduction of the new flavor of Coke in 1985 became widely seen as history's worst marketing debacle. In fact, it was accidentally brilliant in the scope of its failure. Is Coca-Cola about to do the same thing as it tweaks its Coke Zero formula? An article in the New York Times notes, quote, Already on social media, worry and apprehension greeted the impending change. Some consumers vowed to switch to other drinks like Diet Dr. Pepper or threatened to turn to the drink of Coca-Cola's arch rival, Pepsi, end quote. Let's go back to those heady days and parachute pants of the 1980s. Coke was losing market share to Pepsi by the early part of the decade, By 1983, its share of the soft drink market had dropped from 60% following World War II to 24%, according to the debunking site Snopes. Coke had previously offered sugar-free drinks that used artificial sweeteners, but only branded one as Diet Coke in 1982. That drink, based on Tab's formula, shot up quickly to the number four overall drink spot after Coke, Pepsi, and 7-Up, and then exceeded 7-Up by 1984. Diet Coke's taste was considered closer to Pepsi than to the sugary version of Coke. So Coca-Cola did the logical thing. It took its top-selling Diet Coke and replaced the aspartame, the trade name is NutraSweet, with high-fructose corn syrup to create new Coke. Technically, it was Coke with a new label on it. In taste tests, everybody liked Diet Coke plus sugar better than the current Coke or Pepsi. The Coca-Cola company has a remarkably frank account of its 1985 introduction on its website, acknowledging all the failures, but embracing how they fixed the problem. The history notes, quote, The fabled secret formula for Coca-Cola was changed, adopting a formula preferred in taste tests of nearly 200,000 consumers. What these tests didn't show, of course, was the bond consumers felt with their Coca-Cola, something they didn't want anyone, including the Coca-Cola company, tampering with. End quote. Coca-Cola decided to not compete with itself, and it did a full switchover. New Coke would replace Old Coke overnight. Whoops! New Coke appeared April 23rd, 1985. It lasted about three months. Donald Keough, the company's president and chief operating officer at that time, gave what sounds like a heartfelt speech of contrition in a July 11th, 1985 press conference announcing the reintroduction of the original Coke, now dubbed Coca-Cola Classic. What on earth brought us to the decision to bring back the classic taste which we so calmly abandoned back in April? Well, there is a twist to this story, which it seems to me will please every humanist and will probably have uh, Harvard uh, professors puzzling uh, for years. The simple fact is that all of the time and money and skill poured into consumer research on the new Coca-Cola could not measure or reveal the depth and abiding emotional attachment to original Coca-Cola felt by so many people. They said that they wanted the original taste of Coca-Cola back and they wanted it soon. Mother Jones noted in a 2019 article, Quote, on the 10th anniversary of the drink's introduction, the company's CEO, Roberto Guzetta, told employees, sounding more than a bit like Churchill after Dunkirk, that what happened was a blunder and a disaster, and it will forever be. People speak with less moral clarity about war crimes, end quote. During the three-month marketing nightmare, Pepsi grew to outstrip New Coke and Coke Classic combined. However, by forcing people to take a stand and admitting its mistake... The company reinvigorated Coke sales. Coke Classic quickly took the top slot while new Coke faded to a footnote. In a comment worthy of the Poochie episode of The Simpsons, new Coke returned to its home planet. Coke's history page explains, quote, Later, the name of the new taste of Coca-Cola was changed to Coke 2. The product is no longer available in the United States, end quote. 
In 2019, Coca-Cola produced a limited edition of 50,000 cans of new Coke to celebrate the period covered in the Netflix TV series Stranger Things. But that's been its biggest outing since 1985. There was a conspiracy theory about this shift that it was genius marketing instead of a terrible mistake. I believed it when I first heard it, but the dates don't match up. The theory was that Coca-Cola wanted to switch secretly from cane sugar to the much cheaper high fructose corn syrup, or HFCS, which is extracted from corn in a horrible process and led to massive increases in sugar intake over the last four decades. The theory went Coca-Cola would introduce a worst tasting new Coke, then reintroduce the original with HFCS instead of cane sugar, and nobody would notice. They'd be so grateful. Snopes debunks that, noting that starting in 1980, the company allowed its bottlers, Coke-owned and regional partners that produced the final drink, to swap up to half the sugar with HFCS, six months before New Coke, that went up to 100%. Snopes notes, quote, whether they knew it or not, many consumers were already drinking Coke that was 100% sweetened by HFCS, end quote. You can also find contemporary newspaper accounts and other stories from the 1980s that explain this switch before New Coke was introduced. And New Coke wasn't necessarily killed by taste. Most people who opposed it hadn't even tasted the new flavor. Mother Jones's 2019 article, New Coke Didn't Fail, It Was Murdered, notes the way in which the campaign against it started. Quote, in Seattle, a real estate speculator named Gay Mullins formed a group called Old Cola Drinkers of America and set up a hotline where people could call to voice their complaints. They have taken away my freedom of choice, he told people. It's un-American. End quote. If that sounds a bit like anti-coronavirus vaccination advocates today, well, Mother Jones quotes Thomas Oliver's 1986 book, The Real Coke, The Real Story, to explain that there was a northern-southern split here, too. Quote, to them, it was an extension of the Civil War. Here was Coca-Cola, a southern company, laying down its arms in deference to its Yankee counterpart, which was Pepsi. After Coke reintroduced Coke Classic, Gay Mullen started to beat the drum on high fructose corn syrup from Mother Jones, quote, that was how America would come to learn something significant about the man whose rebellion, more than anything else, brought down a soda giant. He didn't even like Coke, end quote. As the Associated Press reported on June 21st, 1985, quote, Gay Mullins had denounced the new Coca-Cola formula as sweeter, flatter, and lacking in that old zing, but in a taste test, he couldn't tell which Coke it was. He picked Royal Crown, end quote. Oliver's book reports that Mullins was actually running an AstroTurf campaign in search of an AstroTurf funder. He tried to get Pepsi, Coca-Cola, and then the Sugar Association, which wanted cane sugar put back into Coke, to pay him something for an endorsement or something else. Mullins eventually switched to drinking that other amazing 1980s drink, Jolt Cola. Mullins would be 93 if he were still alive, but I can't find mentions of him or an obituary after his 1985 15 cases of fame. This time around, Coke Zero seems highly unlikely to suffer the same backlash. Coke has a huge array of varieties it already offers. If you've used one of those drink mixing machines with a touch screen, you know what I mean. I like Diet Cherry and Diet Vanilla Coke myself. You can get many of those products in cans and bottles too. The Times quotes Doug Bauman, professor of marketing at Emory University's Goizeta Business School, yes, named after the former Coke CEO, quote, it is hard to see anyone except the most diehard Coke Zero Sugar people noticing the difference, said Professor Bauman, who from 2002 to 2004 taught courses at Emory to Coca-Cola employees through a program paid for by the company. End quote. Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, the official name, appeared in 2005, and it was already tweaked in 2017. But good news for existing drinkers. Coca-Cola, according to the New York Times, quote, promised on social media that it would not change the ingredients, which include carbonated water, caramel color, phosphoric acid, aspartame, caffeine, and potassium benzoate. Mm-mm, good old potassium benzoate. These beds are made for sleeping people, not for, you know, fake news of the more delightful urban myth variety like spiders pouring out of a store-bought cactus spread around the internet in the last couple weeks. The story was that the Japanese Olympic Committee had designed the beds in the Olympic Village out of cardboard specifically to prevent intercourse. The beds would collapse with any sudden motion, you see, and only support the weight of a single person. 
Now, of course, that makes no sense, given that Olympic athletes might weigh between, say, 100 pounds or 45 kilograms and perhaps 440 pounds or 200 kilograms. And it was quickly debunked. Irish gymnast Reese McLenahan posted a video on Twitter of him jumping up and down on the bed with the caption, quote, anti-sex bed, unquote. The official Olympics Twitter account retweeted McLenahan's message with the caption, thanks for debunking the myth and, quote, the sustainable cardboard beds are sturdy, exclamation point, end of quote. Debunking. See, that's a joke. A bed is a bunk and he debunked the myth. Okay. The beds were designed by a company called Airweave. They're made mostly of renewable materials and are recyclable. However, the official line is that because of the danger of spreading the coronavirus, athletes should stay aloof. From the New York Times, quote, Olympic officials still prefer that athletes sleep alone while in Tokyo and stay away from each other everywhere else as well. A playbook outlining safety measures advises Olympic participants to avoid unnecessary forms of physical contact, such as hugs, high fives, and handshakes, end quote. The pandemic is still raging in Japan, and three cases have already been diagnosed inside the athlete's village, troublesome given the screening that preceded anyone's arrival. Oddly, vaccination is not a requirement for participating athletes, even though coaches and staff must all be vaccinated. It's possible you heard somewhere, maybe in a tiny local newspaper like the Washington Post or on every website everywhere in the world in every language, that Jeff Bezos is heading into space on July 20th. That's tomorrow as I record this as part of the group of four passengers on the first flight of his Blue Origin spacecraft with people on board. This includes the youngest ever person to touch space at 18 years old and the oldest. Wally Funk, 82, who qualified as an astronaut in the 1960s when NASA wouldn't take women to space. Perhaps you'd like to watch the world's wealthiest or sometimes second wealthiest man blast off into what is technically space just above the 62-mile Carmen Mark live on a ship that he paid for. He invests about a billion a year into Blue Origin, his rocket firm. Unlike Elon Musk's SpaceX, Blue Origin has received only a few tens of millions of dollars for specific contracts from the U.S. government. SpaceX has received hundreds of millions, but it's flown 22 resupply missions to the International Space Station. It's been awarded a nearly $3 billion contract to land people on the moon, though the contract has milestones to reach as funds are released. Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic has received, like Blue Origin, almost no direct government money, except New Mexico plowed $200 million into the spaceport that Virgin Galactic uses. Branson flew on July 11th to 53.5 miles above the Earth, which NASA considers space. But as the LA Times noted, the world body governing aeronautic and astronautic records, as well as other organizations, define space as 62 miles above Earth's surface, a designation known as the Karman Line. And quote, Bezos, of course, will be flying above that. Anyway, if you'd like to watch Bezos' vanity launch project, it's slated for 7.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, though it could be pushed back to 9 a.m. You can tune in at blueorigin.com. The voyage will last about 11 minutes. I wish the astronauts a safe trip and safe return. Opening the physical newspaper this weekend, there was a fantastic color photo of a Seattle teenager, Larissa L., wearing an incredible folklorico-inspired dress that was made entirely of duct tape. Here's Larissa L. explaining her costume in her own words, quote, When I heard duct tape had a scholarship, I knew I had to make a special creation. I was inspired by the folklorico style dresses that stem from both indigenous and Spanish practices. The dresses are decorated with ribbon, flowers, and include a full flowy skirt. So I created a ruffled, off-the-shoulder, colorful, folklorico flower gown. The gown is heavily detailed with flowers, duct tape, lace, and ribboning to create the folkloric design, end quote. This was her entry to the Duck Brand Duct Tape Company's annual scholarship competition, Stuck at Prom. Prizes are one $10,000 scholarship in the dress and one $10,000 scholarship in the tux categories. There's no gender requirement, thank goodness, from the rules, quote, at Duck Brand, we're inclusive, so our dress and tux categories are open to anyone and everyone. Just make sure you meet the criteria for the category and contest, end quote. 
eight runners up get $500 plus $100 duct tape packs. The pictures are magnificent. This year, kids don't have to attend prom to qualify or be in a couple photo either, of course. Larissa's outfit took 47 rolls of duct tape and 163 hours to construct. If you're looking to understand the range of creativity teenagers can express under isolation and boredom, Give the gallery a gander. Really amazing work and shockingly great range of people, gender and identity expression, cultures and designs. Duct tape, it really holds us all together. And that's it for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. I'm Glenn Fleischman in for Jackson Bird. You can talk to me about these stories on Twitter at Glenn F. That's G-L-E-N-N-F like Frank. I'll be back tomorrow through Friday and then you'll get Jackson back. Be well.